we watched the first season of Percy Jackson together. We read Sea of Monsters. We've watched the horrendous movies from the, <laughs> the 2010s. And um, now we are on to Titan's Curse. Titan's Curse is kind of where things start to shift. The tone of the book starts to shift. And we even have a much different beginning than we have been having because this one breaks the cycle of, you know, camp versus school time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I think um, to get started, we have um, Percy, Annabeth, and Talia are going on some mission. We don't know what the mission is quite yet in the beginning, but we know they're in the car with Sally. And Percy's just kind of like, this is embarrassing. I have to have my mom drive me to missions <laughs> and yeah. on these quests now. Um, and he's also feeling a little bit of the sting because he's noticing the difference in how people treat him versus Talia. And also, Annabeth has been with Talia more than him at this point because they went to a girls' school together. So mm -hmm. he's feeling a little bit out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's definitely on the outside. Mm -hmm. of everything and it's just like this is really weird and awkward and just strange um i think it's funny that we talked about harry potter last week mm -hmm. and like how lazy jk rowling is with how she would just start everything at the dursleys and keep doing that because it was the easiest way for people to literally like show up and like explain things to harry mm -hmm. and like reading this first chapter was so refreshing because there's so many things in it that you as the reader don't even know what's going on. Like some of it, Percy doesn't even know what's going on, but you as the reader also don't know what the fuck is going on. And it was just so nice to read, like after talking about that so much, seeing that like in action, like remember that there was some line where he, where Percy was saying like, oh, all of the satyrs have been like out all the time. Yeah. Because he's trying to find as many demigods as possible. And he's saying, like, there aren't that many of them out there, but they're like trying to find however many they can because we need more people. They yeah. don't explain why that is. <laughs> they yeah, just like, so say that. I, I, I underlined good. that because he what he says exactly is we were losing campers. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so does that mean people were dying? Does that mean people were joining Luke's side? We don't know yet. Yeah. And like, if you're like somehow a new person who is like reading this book for the first time, you're like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> also, like, what do you mean? And like us too, we're like, what does that mean? Um, it, like, like what you said, you don't know what that really means, but it just, it like immediately makes you realize like, this is stressful. Like even when he it, like thinks about Luke, when somebody brings up Luke somewhere in these chapters, he says, person I thought was a friend who tried to kill me many times mm -hmm. and that's just like the way he describes him it's just like yeah that's who Luke is <laughs> and yeah. it, there's none of like the you know the over explaining or even just whatever it's just like yeah that's who this is and everything is terrible <laughs> and it's just kind of like we don't know necessarily why they're at this school besides that they're supposed to find people mm -hmm. and the thing I think people always really like about this everyone people like everything about this book but um just from the start the fact that it's only a couple months after um sea of monsters happened like this is like three months after that book ended it's yeah. not a full year there it's he's 14 but he turned 14 a couple months ago it's basically like after one semester of school and so everything is still different and i could just like imagine how easy it would be to film those things for the show eventually because of the fact that they film in Canada yeah that I was like yeah it's not going to be hard for them to find a place to film for this kind of stuff outdoors in the winter in Canada <laughs> like that would be very easy for them yeah but I mean they do mention snow so that's that's the one thing I mean they can make it look wintry but yeah I don't know maybe they can make snow sticks somewhere for a day <laughs> but yeah I I really liked how Percy also I like how Rick wrote how Percy feels very like unsure of where he stands with literally everyone that he's ever met. Mm -hmm. And that that like feeling so unsure about all of that is like a way for us as the audience to like learn about 
what's going on with that like slowly yeah. as like the first chapter goes on you start to like hear little details and you're like what is happening <laughs> like what is happening um with all of these people like like what you said like the fact that Thalia and Annabeth has been at school together and he hasn't been there mm -hmm. um and especially like the end of the the trip when they get to forget the name of the school it doesn't matter um yeah <laughs> when they get when they get to the school and Thalia says something nice about his mom and he's just like this is too much I need to get out of this I just need this conversation to end now can we please just go because they're all just like anxious and like can we just go now please <laughs> and, yeah, and poor and, Percy has had to endure his mom telling baby stories the whole yeah. time while he's sitting in the car like we're going on well, this mission and like can you imagine like being in a car with people that you haven't seen in months one of them you're not really sure about with like Thalia and your mom is the only one talking because you're all really nervous because you don't know what's gonna happen when you get to school like you all could die when you get to the school and then your mom just like is the only one that when she gets really anxious doesn't know how to shut the fuck up <laughs> and so she just keeps talking and it's just like i need you to be silent now please because this is like too much noise um that's like how i take that stuff anyway but more of the fact like when they get out of the car that thalia says something nice about sally like oh your mom's really nice and he's like yeah she is and he just asks her like oh have you ever did you talk to your mom again, you know, after you came back to life, after being dead for the last six years? Yeah. And she immediately is just like, starts saying like, that's none of your business. And it's just like, whoa, <laughs> like, yeah. whoa, like, okay. <laughs> like, he just asked her a question. And considering that you just heard baby stories from him, I don't think it's out of the realm possibility for him to just ask if you've talked to your mom before. Yeah, I think this is one like one of those outsider things per Percy because we as the audience both already understand that you don't ask demigod kids about their parent even if you're talking about the mortal one because it's usually not a good story. Um, mm -hmm. But Percy hasn't quite discovered or I think he hasn't discovered that that's the norm yet because he's really only gotten that personal with a few people. And yeah. so he knows and it's, it's Annabeth's reality, but he doesn't know it's everybody else's. It's also like a thing of like, that's just what you ask people. Mm -hmm. Like people have, people have just like asked me, even me stuff like that, even though they, I can tell once they ask it that they see on their face that they shouldn't have asked it. Like I don't like rip their heads off when they ask me stuff like that mm -hmm. or did it in the past, but it's more of a thing of like, yeah, it, it makes sense for him to want to ask her like did you see have you talked to your mom since you came back to life like and instead of saying no she's like get the fuck out of my face basically and it's just it immediately kind of shows you like why he feels so unsure about everything because mm -hmm. he's just trying to get to know her better and she's like get away from me yeah and so it's like okay <laughs> so i shouldn't talk to you about anything at all um one thing just with these beginning chapters I thought was really interesting was so many people in like the earlier books compare Percy to Thalia and like say that they're similar. Um, and like the fandom at large says that and I'm like, they're not that similar. <laughs> at least in these two chapters, they're not very similar at all. And I was like surprised about how different, how different they really are. <laughs> yeah, well, um... I would say Talia is a lot like me in that for her, the um, alternative dress is sort of an armor in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so I would imagine that she looks a bit intimidating. I mean, there's there's an astrologer here on TikTok who's talked about my rising sign, Aquarius rising, as being like an electric fence aura because it just yeah. kind of makes people think like, is she mean? Um, <laughs> but I, I, I have... I have the impression that she might come off that way, both because of how she dresses and because she seems to have this brave face she puts on. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I don't think Percy sees through it because he's very much just like, yeah, I am intimidated. Yeah, and it, well, and it's also a thing, at least what I remember of him in this book is like, he would like 
to be able to like get through that and he does at a certain point but it does take a while mm -hmm. but it's like a thing of like if every time you talk to a person they sound like mad at you and you're just not going to want to talk to them at some point it's like there's only so many times that somebody can be like really abrasive towards you where you just like stop trying and especially things that i remember happen in in this book very soon after this he has every reason to just like try not try too hard with being around her too much because she doesn't really give it's one of those things like she doesn't really give a lot of cues that she likes him mm -hmm. like and wants to be around him and like a lot of that stuff isn't necessarily his fault yeah um, it's just how it is i suppose they go into that later but it's just that when that dynamic is going on there's only so much that you're gonna do like once somebody is like get out of my face i'm like okay i like yeah. i i won't i won't talk to you anymore if that's if outside of like when i have to i suppose if that's like the reaction it's like what else are you are you supposed to do well it's i think annabeth really if she hadn't met talia when she was so young she would have never broken through it herself the no. only reason that they have a relationship like that is because she was the little girl who she was helping you know mm -hmm. and as as much as you put up that electric fence aura sometimes with the way you dress and the way that you act you're gonna drop it for an innocent child if you don't actually mean it so yeah 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 and like annabeth is there to be like anyway let's continue into the school <laughs> yeah so they go in and they're at a military academy which right away okay so this i put on my instagram story because i was impressed with rick so they run into two teachers and mm -hmm. we should know right away that if a detail about somebody sticks out it's probably important so one of the mm -hmm. things that's mentioned about these two kind of administrators, they're not actually teachers, I guess, um, that are they run into is one has heterochromia. He has a brown eye and a blue eye. And Percy is like, oh, like an alley cat. So that's like a little hint of there's something feline about him, I think. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that Percy notes about him is that he speaks with a accent he can't really place. And he's like, I think French. It's because mm -hmm. manticores it, it was borrowed from like Persian kind of mythology. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a few different creatures like this, like the Phoenix is one where it was written in almost a history book, but it was a story passed on from travelers that played telephone too much to the point where it's like, yeah, so there's this lion thing with a face and a barbed tail. Mm -hmm. um, there's not too many details about it, so there really is room to invent around manticores in mythology. But um, yeah, I thought the detail that like, the story got passed around in Persia and that's where it came from and him having a French-ish accent possibly yeah. leading to farsi was like of course rick thought of that <laughs> <laughs> they put so many little he put so many things like that if yeah. you look up the myths or you just know them like you do that's always fun to like realize that these little details have like an actual reason that they're not you know the curtain the blue curtains aren't just blue for no reason that there is yeah. a purpose behind that stuff um the part about that that i liked with that obvious like villain monster guy is i always like because of people saying that percy is stupid mm -hmm. um when he is being smart that during that interaction he immediately is like you're there's something wrong with you yeah. you're like you're a bad guy there's something off and strange about you i don't know what it is but there's something there's something wrong with you here i just don't know what it is yet um i always appreciate when they show that percy is smart <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just just to like continue to reiterate that fact as many times as humanly possible. Um, and then the other thing that happens during that interaction is Thalia doing the trick yep. with the mist that he was never taught. He didn't even know it existed. That's how no. foreign it is to him. No, he has no idea what she's doing mm -hmm. and is thinking that they're about to get like super thrown out into the cold and in big trouble because there's no way that this is going to work and then it does like 
that's like one of those things of <laughs> this is like an overall thing from these uh first two chapters but the way that there's like an obvious hierarchy mm -hmm. in this like system and how it just works and it's just like frustrating reading it reading it because of how it affects him and that and how re stupid <laughs> honestly all of it is like of course i'm autistic i hate every hierarchy in existence but it is stupid like the just the idea that like she was taught this by chiron like i was just thinking like when he, i read that like wow imagine like um when they were going on like the first quest and they were trying to run away from the police how nice it would have been to have that yeah to it be able be to use on people like that would have been really great they wouldn't have had to do all that stuff and and get involved with aries as much as they had to or whatever if they could have used that to like not have to do all this stuff with the cops um mm -hmm. but like nobody bothered to tell him and i honestly think that it's because she's a zeus child that people just take her more seriously mm -hmm. and they think that she should be the one in charge of everything because she's just a child of zeus and it's like but why <laughs> like there there is reason for it they just treat her like that and it's yeah. and it's the whole scapegoat golden child thing like she's another like golden child role where she just gets stuff so much easier than he does and gets the benefit of the doubt in every situation that he never gets like reading this again i was like so the plan for these villains was to kidnap him like that and i don't think i realized that or like necessarily put that together as much when i read this or i, I don't remember when i read these like these this a million times the first time is that like there was no way that they're ever gonna like leave this place with like nico and bianca and be fine because mm -hmm. the whole reason why the principal was even stalking nico and bianca at all was because they were using them as bait to capture him so they could take him somewhere and torture him yeah and then kill him probably and so it's like there was never a point when they were going to actually be successful in any of this and they don't actually care about even taking nico and bianca <laughs> they're just using them and that's like crazy considering who their like godly parent is like how powerful those kids are that the Mandacorp doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> they don't give a fuck. Well, like, we have Luke to assume and... that, like, if if the kids don't know, they haven't been claimed yet, which means that monsters possibly don't know either. They might not, but they at least know that they're, they at least, like, set up, like, stalking. It was so interesting seeing that. Like, that's why, like, Grover could never get close enough to them to talk to them, because mm -hmm. the principal kept trying to keep them away from him so that he wouldn't be able to help them before Percy showed up. That yep. was the only reason why they were doing all that stuff, was just so he could try to delay it long enough so he could take Percy. And it's just like, oh, like that's what the general, and I know, I know who the general is, but I'm not going to say it, but that's what the general and Luke and stuff, that's what their plan was. Okay, they wanted to take Percy, and that just sucks. <laughs> because yeah. it just sucks to know that, like, like what we were just saying about Thalia, that like Chiron taught her the trick and everyone defers to her for like leadership, but they don't care about her. Like the, by, by that, I mean like the monsters, the Luke and Chiron and like Kronos and stuff for him. And because they're not taking him as seriously anymore, like things just like go wrong because nobody considers like oh maybe they're going after percy like for, for the last he actually cares about thalia like we do <laughs> but it like it doesn't even occur to them and so all this stuff in this in these chapters happen the way that they do because they're like almost surprised by that because they almost like forgot like yeah. oh right chronos really likes percy that's mm. correct <laughs> yeah um like, yeah. oh, right, Kronos really likes Percy. That's mm. correct. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see what the next note I have is. So um, they get by through the mist trick, which 
Grover Grover finds them at this point and immediately like realizes what happens and Percy notices, yeah, everybody's talking towards her. Like, why mm -hmm. is nobody paying attention to me? And then they keep moving forward. Um, we find out that at this military school, there's supposed to be a dance that night. And another interesting note, I was like, Rick does not miss. Um, Grover hurried us into a door that had Jim written on the glass. Even with my dyslexia, I could read as much. Gymnasium is a Greek word. Um, <laughs> it's just like, I wonder if like words of Greek origin don't, don't do the like mm -hmm. word shipping as much for him. That's funny. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um let's see so and then they get into the actual um the actual dance and that's where we have the line about how chiron put in all of the recruiting efforts and so grover has been sent out to the school obviously but they said every school from fourth through high school they're looking for demigods and um i mean it's kind of interesting having a school-aged kid too thinking like could there be a satyr like hidden amongst these children? Um, mm -hmm. Because when you think about it, like Grover really would blend in. I mean, the curly hair. Um, I, I think they give him like kind of a freckly kind of look in the books mm -hmm. too. Not that like Aryan also doesn't have a young face, but like yeah. this idea that like, you know, they look young, they kind of camouflage in, and so um, they're just around. I also never picked up in the first book that, like, the reason it's satyrs going after them is because their sense of smell. I, I don't know why I didn't pick that up, but it yeah. was Percy saying something about how once the kids are discovered, they'll smell extra good to monsters, and the satyrs will be able to pick them out easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I only know that just from reading this whole series so many times yeah but that is like i liked how percy has that part where he's like i wonder what it is about how we smell that makes monsters like go after us and then remembering that they put a scene of that into the show where oh. um grover explains that to percy in like the third episode about what it is that they even notice i always really liked that scene that they had them say that like that monsters come after you depending on what you're dealing with and so they're attracted to certain things about mm -hmm. you like almost like your emotions are like coming out of you in a weird way and so it was cool to see him be like i wonder what that means <laughs> and then like remember that they that rick went back and explained that for us many years later <laughs> yeah um what was i gonna say the main thing i was gonna say about just like percy being like out of everything mm -hmm. is just how ridiculous <laughs> the hierarchy stuff is. It's almost like fascinating to watch in like a weird way how fast that can all change. Mm -hmm. Because I definitely know this sort of feeling of like nothing that you do, it seems to be like good enough for people in like the long term. Yeah. Because I was just thinking like Percy has tried so hard to like fit in or like you know be accepted by these people like he didn't want to go on the quest in the first book but he did it for his mom and then ended up being successful and everybody liked him once he came back from that quest and then immediately in sea of monsters that's like thrown out the window again <laughs> uh when because he shows up with tyson mm -hmm. and they don't like tyson for their for basically that entire book except for like the very last scene basically yeah um and so he he like has to like get everybody's like acceptance basically at camp back after that purely just because they're being prejudiced <laughs> against yeah. his like half brother only for then after things seem okay for like five minutes for Thalia to show up and for all of that to be thrown out the window again and it's just that whole feeling of I'm trying so hard to like fit into like the one place that I should fit in like I I'm gonna be the one that does the prophecy to save all of your asses but yeah. nobody cares about me the way that I care about them or like they don't care about me as much as I care about them it seems and it's just like he's handling it honestly as best as he possibly could especially as a 14 year old kid but it's just like that frustrating thing of like suddenly his friends just don't even 
consider to ask him for anything anymore and it's because they're just so used to asking Thalia and it's like but what about everything that he's done up until this point does none of that matter anymore because Thalia is back like was he just a placeholder for her Aww. um and now that she, and now that she's back like everything that he does like didn't doesn't matter as much anymore it's just that sort of a feeling and that's such a scapegoat feeling and it's just so frustrating yeah. to feel like you can't you just can't you just like can't get there and it's one of those things of like if he shows how annoyed he is by that they would just get mad at him yeah so he just like is like i guess i'm just gonna stand here yeah <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Grover tells us the situation is their siblings at the school. He thinks they're both demigods and that um, the principal has been, like you said, keeping him away. And that's why he's feeling the push. Like, we have to do this now at this dance before we go to break and everybody's gone. And so Percy, because everybody is looking towards Talia, is just like, I guess we're going with this. Okay, let's go into the dance. Yeah. And it's like, a, and it's just like, okay, I guess I'm just gonna go with what everybody else is doing since nobody has bothered to ask me what I think. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, okay, I don't know why I'm. It's almost like a moment of like, I'm not sure why I'm really here. Um, the, <laughs> I liked like also the little comment he makes where, when there when Thalia tells them to dance, mm -hmm. and. It, and Annabeth is like, have you never danced with anyone or ever gone to like a dance before? And he's like, yeah, but it's not like any, like basically is like, it's not like any girl would want to dance with him. Mm -hmm. And it's just like that, like thing of like, yeah, that that's who Percy is when he's at school. Like yeah. nobody likes him at school. <laughs> and so, yeah, he would be the kid that would go to the dance and just like stand in the corner the whole time. Yeah. And but because nobody wants him. Basketball, uh, yeah. which like my middle school had that too where like because the dance they had it partially in the cafeteria and then they would have the gym open too and so some kids would hang out in the gym and play basketball while the other kids would be on the dance floor mm -hmm. um so yeah it's kind of interesting that he's like i was a basketball kid i'm gonna go play basketball while everybody else is dancing i never even went to any of those at my middle school like they had them Mm -hmm. But I just remember thinking, like, I would have to wear a dress, and I don't really like doing that. And also, like, everyone hates me here, so, like, why would I try to get my mom to give me money to pay that we don't have to go to a dance at school to be around everyone who bullies me so relentlessly that I'm scared to come here? Like, That's why would I do that? <laughs> and so I didn't. And that was a weird, like, this brought back those, like, middle school sort of memories of remembering going into school on Monday and everybody talking about how much fun they had at the dance and, and like, pictures that they would take and stuff like that. And and I would just sit there, like, and wait for everybody to stop talking about it. Because I'm like, I'll, I didn't go to any dances until I was, like, a senior in high school. Yeah, the middle school dances, I, I actually did okay with friends in middle school. Um, I remember I got in trouble once for wearing Heelys on the dance floor. That's that's really the only thing that comes to mind with uh, middle school, because it was that like the first time Heelys were big. <laughs> and um, let's see, so the dance reference that's made next is, um, there's like a topical reference, Jesse McCartney, which yeah. like, I was even too old for this reference back then. Um, he was kind of like a Disney kind of person. Mm -hmm. He was like on the fridges of Disney, but had a music career was my understanding of him. Beautiful Soul is the only song of his that I can name. Um, have not seen what he looks like now, but it's kind of funny that he's the one that's mentioned. And like, mm -hmm. was it in the first book that Rick mentioned Hilary Duff? So yes. he's got kind of, for some reason, he was really on the nose with Disney. <laughs> Kids. <laughs> his kids must have been like watching some of that stuff or something yeah <laughs> for him to like at least be aware of it and we have Talia <laughs> saying this music is awful and Grover's like I picked it <laughs> <laughs> yeah and Grover being like wait why don't you like it it's like yeah. oh Grover you little sweetheart yeah uh, you would pick that sort of music and that's okay yeah. um, I only know it uh, just oh my god one of my best friends when I was growing up, 
especially in middle in like high school he liked jesse mccartney and would make us listen to it and i hated it i there was something in that song like there's like a lyric in the song that doesn't make sense mm-hmm. and i cannot listen to songs that the lyrics don't make logical sense and so there's some line in it that i'm like what the fuck like i was like what does this even mean this is like just stupid and so he would play it when i was in the car to piss me off basically (laughs) he also would play aaron carter for the same reason (laughs) it's the same thing like honestly that was kind of where my brain went and why i never paid attention to jesse mccartney i was like i've seen this already white blonde boy who sings yes i was just (laughs) like what are we doing um (laughs) uh what was i gonna say about them oh uh i know that them like dancing or like trying to dance is one of those things that people think is like romance like stuff which it probably is whatever but uh i don't care about that <laughs> so, <laughs> just gonna be honest i i think it's funny that uh they put out a description for the tv show and in the description they say something about how percy and Annabeth friendship is going to change and everybody was like oh romance and i'm like no it's because they fight the entire time (laughs) like that's that's i think you need to reread the book and like remember what happens in that thing because that's that's actually what happens um not romance necessarily at this point i hope not they're 13 13 year olds don't don't know anything about romance I feel like there's already a little bit of that, but they don't quite understand it. They're like, I'm no. very pulled towards this person. I'm very protective towards this person, but I don't quite know why. And yeah. um, both of them feel it towards each other, but they are mad at each other the entire book. So yeah, it's <laughs> not going to be a romance dynamic quite yet. It's I like, think we get it's... a moment when when uh, Annabeth gets her Cersei makeover. It's like the platonic, it's mostly platonic love, probably. Like you I feel like so old but like when you're a kid when you're that young you don't understand like romance you're too young to under like people dating Mm -hmm. in like seventh and eighth grade is like they go to the movies with somebody's parents sitting right next to them or they like go bowling if you're from the midwest like me um or go to like school dances or something it's like not even it's not even real it's not real dating you don't like have that capabilities yet and so i almost get like worried when people like want them to be more aggressive about it i'm like these characters are too young to even be ready for that yet like i would be worried if 13 year old percy and annabeth were like making out in the corner or something they're too young they're way too young for any of that (laughs) it like they need to like build up to it um, no, it's a traumatized kid thing. It is a traumatized kid thing. I, my first boyfriend, I was twelve. So, um, and my mom would drop me off at the mall by myself or at the movies by myself. Um, so yeah, the, the neglectful parents. More stuff happens. We'll just say that. Okay, I believe that. I know that. I avoided it all, but I'm sure it does. But the thing about that conversation that I like, interesting. It just shows like how much. It's only been a couple months since the end of Sea of Monsters, but so much is, like, different with him. Is mm-hmm. that, like, he's asking her about school. Like, I like how he's, like, not sure what to say. Mm-hmm. So he asks her about her special interests and asks her about, like, have you built any interesting buildings lately? And she, like, of course starts info dumping on her, which is every neurodivergent person's friendship <laughs> is how that works. Like, that's just how that all works. Um and so it was cute but then also interesting to see him think about how he's like disappointed that she likes her school so much because it means that they're never going to be able to go to the same school together Mm -hmm. and he misses you know he wants to be able to see her every day instead of not it's one of those things of even though they live in new york they both live in new york city they live on they go to school on opposite ends of the city Mm -hmm. And so they haven't actually seen each other. And he's like, I want to be able to see you every day. Um, And realizing like, oh, but she really likes the school. So we're probably not going to be able to see each other. That really sucks. Um, And just kind of like, it's that awkward thing where you're like disappointed because you're happy that your friend is happy. But you like are sad because their happiness is like outside of something that includes you. 
mm-hmm. basically, and it's just like that conflict, sad, like conflicting sort of feeling of I wish I could go to school with you every day, but I generally don't think that he could. I think that's an all girl school, but even if it wasn't, I think most schools that Annabeth goes to, he probably wouldn't be able to get into. Yeah, because of she how many he's kid. been kicked out of, and she hasn't been kicked out of like that much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have them catching up and then Annabeth starts talking about her dad. She does get into her dad. And so, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Leah even said this in an interview. We know she's had some like mortal kid experiences. Leah says she's gone to Disneyland, um, that kind of stuff. But we find out her dad wants to move, that he just took a job in San Francisco. Now there is vague talk and Percy doesn't catch on to what she's saying. I'm pretty sure what she's trying to say, because she's like, I don't know if I want to go to San Francisco. It's right there. And Percy's like, what's right there? And then they got get caught off track because they noticed that um, the D or no, they noticed that Grover and Talia are no longer in sight. And then Percy notices the D'Angelo twins getting taken off the dance floor. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so I think she was trying to say because it's so close to the underworld. That was what my first thought was. Because, like, it's, yeah, I don't think of San Francisco as right next to the underworld, but it's closer than New York, I guess. It's something else that is in this book, and I don't remember what it is either. Okay. Like, when they said that, I'm like, I know that things happen in, in this book in San Francisco. Like, I remember that, but that, that's where they're, yeah. like, trying to get to. Um, but I don't remember it all. And, like, that part I actually liked because... Percy has no idea what she's talking about, and he just does that traumatized person game where he just acts like he knows. Yeah. Um, He just is like, yeah, obviously, sure. And he has has no idea what she's talking about, but he doesn't want to have to admit that to her, like, I don't know what you mean. And it's one of those things with the books that happen sometimes, like, in in these sort of situations is that people just like assume that Percy knows things that nobody has bothered to actually tell him. And then they get annoyed that he doesn't know. And it's like, how is he supposed to know through osmosis? Like you have to tell him what's in San Francisco. Yeah. If if no one has actually told him what what could be there, Mm -hmm. there's no way for him to know about it. And like the stuff with her dad was really interesting about how so like this is probably going to come up in like the next group of chapters we read but I can like say it now because I know what it means like when she's starting to say to him like I want to tell you like what I'm thinking about but she never like finishes that thought because they get interrupted that's about her joining the the hunters Mm -hmm. and because she gets you know she's gone at the end of this chapter but he finds like stuff for the hunters like in her backpack and stuff and i'm like so annabeth is desperate enough to not move to san francisco because it's close to something like i generally don't remember what it is um and is far away from camp and everybody else that she is thinking about giving up her immortality Mm -hmm. to do that which would mean she would she wouldn't be at camp anymore yeah like she wouldn't be mortal anymore and and she's willing to do all of that just just as a way to like not have to live with her dad and her specifically like her stepmom like i'm pretty sure in that part percy specifically asked like is your stepmom okay because he knows that she's the monster (laughs) of that situation like her dad is also not the best either like he lets her stepmom do that but Mm -hmm. it she's also the one that is causing most of the problems um and i just thought i want to like artemis but when i read that i was like this doesn't seem okay (laughs) that that like especially when we get we'll get to when they're introduced and i'm like why are you all so young and you gave up your entire life when you're not even the oldest one is 14 Mm -hmm. and i'm like you gave up your entire mortal life to somebody when you were not even you're not even in high school yet um that doesn't seem 
like a good idea to me. <laughs> yeah. And so like me reading this from like my adult perspective, I was just like, I have like a whole thing I want to say about that, <laughs> that probably will make people mad, but I don't care. Um, but I thought that that was the whole thing with also with Bianca and them being taken away. It's one of those things that's like interesting about this whole weird like group dynamic that's happening where everybody just like defers to Thalia. Mm -hmm. um, and like Annabeth is almost like being her fangirl, like is like, it's so exciting to see Thalia back to like kill all the things and things like that. And I'm just like, oh my God. Um, yeah. And like just how much everyone just immediately just like goes to her and they don't even think about necessarily what they're doing anymore. That like because of that, he's the only one who actually notices where they're going. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, the one that nobody's paying attention to is the one that notices when they're being taken. Yeah. And of course, he's the one that they're actually trying to take the entire time. And yeah. it's like, wow, if one of you would have like asked him what was going on or, or like gone with him, so much of this stuff would have gone very differently. And maybe, maybe the end wouldn't have happened the way that it did. But people yeah. are so like wrapped up in Thalia that they don't even think about it. They're just like, we have to find Thalia. And it's like, okay. Yeah, and that. I love how he has that thought process of, I don't have to wait for her. I've been through stuff, too. <laughs> yeah, it's like, um, hi, I, I, Poseidon is my dad, and I, I do know how to do things, and I can maybe, and it's also a thing of, like, what is he supposed to do? Just, like, stand there while he knows that some kids are possibly being kidnapped who don't even know, like, that they're demigods or anything like that like obviously he's gonna follow them to make sure that they're okay what else is he supposed to do yeah. in that situation like that's that's not a good idea to just like sit back and just like let it happen <laughs> and yeah. especially when he already doesn't trust the you know the the principal guy he's already like your eyes are weird there's something off about you i know that you're a bad thing i just don't know what you are um when it's him especially taking tiny little nico and bianca <laughs> Um, yeah. he's going to be the one to like run off and make sure that they're okay. They are so, so, they're so little. Like the fact that Nico, Nico is playing the Percy Jackson version of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And it uses, they call it mytho magic. Um, mm -hmm. they, they made a ver like cards for it for the first season of the show. Yeah. Um, and that's one of those things that people have asked them to make and we'll see if they make it but oh my gosh that'd be so good <laughs> yeah and but like walker i know and Aryan have said that in interviews that they basically just like made up a game when they were playing because they were supposed to be playing with the cards in like the very first scene of the show and so they basically just made up their version of how to play mytho magic because there are no rules or anything like that yet Mm -hmm. um, but they do, of course, because these children took almost everything on set. <laughs> like, yeah. like one of the funniest things about this show is like how people just openly call all three of them kleptomaniacs because they just they literally took everything. Yeah. Like I, I saw like this one interview, like especially Walker, like <laughs> this one interview I saw with Charlie. He was like, "Yeah, a couple months after we got home." from filming and everything i get this thing in the mail from walker and it's uh, like he stole his like sword <laughs> like backbiter like the real the real sword not like the prop mm -hmm. sword the real sword and he he took like they let him take like the the riptide sword and oh he stole like <laughs> he stole charlie's actual sword and then sent it to him in the mail as like a surprise <laughs> they there's so many videos of them just like holding up like shields that they took on set all of the clothes that they had they took everything and so i know that walker has the mytho magic games in his house <laughs> because and i'm pretty sure Aryan has his copy too because they like the prop people had to literally start over <laughs> because they took everything <laughs> i'm just imagining them emailing them and being like can you send me all of your stuff back <laughs> Yeah, can you bring this back to set, please? <laughs> he follows 
the D'Angelo's because he's like, okay, this is an emergency situation. Nobody knows that they're going this way. So I'm going to go this way. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, he finds them, he starts talking to them and they have this look of fear in their eyes. And he's like, oh, it must be because I have riptide in my hand. So he's like, I'm, I'm not going to hurt you. You're good. Mm -hmm. And it turns out they were looking behind him. (laughs) Yeah. They were like, Bianca was like trying to tell him (laughs) without saying it out loud, like, Mm -hmm they're setting a trap for you please run away um oh that's what i was saying is that they're so little that nico is 10 and bianca is 12 and they're just like they don't have anybody and they're just like oh my god just imagining nico at a military school (laughs) no (laughs) no 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 please no um okay that's really weird to think about i'm glad that ended for him very quickly (laughs) um but i did like how that i could like picture that interaction that of like him trying to console them and then not realizing because he's trying to like calm them down and take care of them so much that they're actually trying to warn him about what's behind him yeah um but i i really liked the whole um empathy link between him and Grover and him just like yelling at him inside of his own head for like five minutes. Like, will you just notice that I'm gone? (laughs) Will you notice that I'm upset, that I'm scared, that I don't know what's happening, that somebody is like kidnapping me with these two kids and I'm by myself because all of you ignore me. And so nobody is here to back me up. And I don't know what to do because what, because he hits him with poison again. Mm -hmm. um so he's limited on like what he can do like fighting wise yeah it's like i can't leave these kids and it's when like it's the whole thing that they don't like i'm not sure if he necessarily he doesn't realize it until they have like some villain monologue time outside but he doesn't know he doesn't know until that point that they're trying to take him Mm -hmm. And so he's just thinking they're trying to take these kids and I have to stop them from killing these kids before, before I can save them. But it's, it's the other way around. Like the kids are just there to trap him and there's nothing that he can really do about that. And it's one of those things, I don't know, like, just like imagining how much easier that would have gone if Annabeth was there the whole time watching him, she Mm -hmm. could have just ambushed the minute the thing the the manticore from behind when they were still in the school before things accelerated to the point that it did outside yeah Um, but they they weren't there yeah so percy does end up getting stung um and he's trying with all of his might like let me use this empathy link he even closes his eyes at one point and dr thorne is like what the hell are you doing kid and he's like oh I'm, i'm in pain um yeah, so Percy doesn't know that this empathy link still works. He doesn't know if it works when they're awake. And mm-hmm. to be honest, we don't exactly get the confirmation. I mean, they come to the rescue, but we don't know that they came to the rescue because Grover heard them or because they just came. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. The next thing that I kind of caught on to is that the room that Dr. Thorne leads them into Percy instinctively knows that it is overlooking a cliff over the sea. And at one point, it seems like Dr. Thorne is going to push them out. And Percy was fully ready for it, but Bianca pulls him back and is like trying to save him. And he's like, geez, thanks. (laughs) Like, (laughs) I would have been fine. Um, I liked like the conversations between him and Nico and Bianca are just so Mm -hmm. just like funny but also just like oh god um like that only always that mix of like funny and also kind of sad when they don't know that they're demigods yet yeah because he's trying to tell them like if i jump into this water i can save us because my dad will help me and they're like and bianca's just like okay so you're just a crazy person yeah Um, that's good and he's also and she thinks that like the principal is also just a crazy person Mm -hmm. and that's like that makes sense that's what you would think if some if suddenly people are talking about all these crazy things and you don't know what's going on like talking about the general and things like that that she does she doesn't know who any of this stuff is or what they're even doing and nico is just like you sound really cool um 
wow, who are you exactly? Yeah. <laughs> and so we get a little bit of a villain monologue here. Do Dr. Thorne is still in human form, by the way, um, mm -hmm. where he mentions the Great Stirring, which is a bunch of old monsters being reawakened that haven't been awoken for years. So we do know now that stuff is, has been brewing behind the scenes when it comes to probably Kronos and Luke um mm -hmm. and that this is an extension of it so to speak at that point i would say um mm -hmm. but right after that is when annabeth comes in percy realizes what's happening but i'm sure nobody else does because mm -hmm. annabeth is wearing her invisibility cap and she tackles percy bianca and nico to the ground not out the cliff but just onto the ground in the room mm -hmm. and um percy calls it a brilliant move um because it actually, in doing that, she was able to save them from getting stuck by thorns. Yeah, it is really a really s smart move for her to do to make sure that he doesn't get poisoned again and the little kids don't get poisoned at all. Mm -hmm. um, is, I think there, that's the point when he says, he starts talking about the general and he's like, oh, you're, you're from Luke. So like, Luke is trying to take me and he's like, this is bigger than Luke and da 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 I, I know who the general is. Um, yeah. I'm not going to say who it is, but it's definitely one of the things that has like, you know, woken up and is around again and is why they're trying to find any demigods they can because all of these like powerful beings against them are coming out of the woodwork now oh, wow. that Luke and Kronos are doing things and stuff. Um, yeah, and so ugh, it's just, it's one of those things of being reminded again that all of this stuff is happening because of Luke. Yeah. <laughs> that these people wouldn't be coming back if he wasn't doing what he was doing. Um, and, and also it tells you without like being as like clunky, I want to use the word, as like Harry Potter and stuff, that um that like the stakes of what they're going up against are like already accelerating to uh -huh. like a place that the series hasn't been before um like i compare i compare this book a lot to prisoner of azkaban and a lot of people do not only because it's the third book but also because they're it's they're both kind of the book where like the stakes are like risen Mm -hmm. um but this book is way better at that than prisoner of azkaban even though i really liked prisoner of azkaban as one of my f it was that one in like order of the phoenix that were my favorite harry potter books yeah um but this one does it better in the way that the stakes that are being raised are just explained better and they're also just like scarier mm -hmm. in a way because there are like demigods who are dying but the it's also a point of like it's like three things are happening at once, basically, like some demigods are dying, some demigods are joining Luke, and some demigods, some monsters that they've never dealt with before, they would never deal with, like the general, are coming after them that are not that are worse than the things that they've been after before. Like, it's not just Kronos, it's not just Luke, it's also this other thing, mm -hmm. and these other people that are connected to the general, like this... Like part of this whole interaction, I think, of why Purse almost like is like confused during it is because it's happening in a way that's like different from every other villain interaction they've had at this point. Because up until now, Luke has been like the main, you know, person that they're fighting. And so he's like, okay, Luke sent you. I know how to handle you. I know what he wants. He wants me. He wants to kidnap me for the millionth time or, or like take me alive. Like the, the guy, like the minute, the, the guy right. says, like, Thorn says, like, oh, you're lucky that he, he wants you to be taken alive um, so that he, they can torture him some more. But um, the, he knows that. And so it's like, okay, I know wh who you are and, like, what you want. But then this guy is, like, talking about somebody else. And then all of a sudden there's, like, a fucking helicopter <laughs> that's yeah. also shooting at them from the sky. And it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> Wait, and so it's like, know. that is... I way bigger that is way bigger and way more dangerous and way bigger than these sort of situations yeah. usually are for them and so it's like what do i 
he like honestly doesn't know what to do because it's like this is this sort of thing has never happened before like even like thorn says to him like if you would jump off of the cliff and jump into the water i would kill you before you even got to the water Mm -hmm. and it's just like he's so over his head because these things that he's fighting against are way more powerful than he is and he's a 14 year old kid who doesn't who never had to interact with this level of like evil people before and it's just like like, (laughs) what am i doing okay but before we get there i want to jump back because this is such a dnd like everything about the next couple um things that happen is so dungeons and dragons so (laughs) grover takes out his pipes and he starts playing and it does this vine attack where a vine comes out and um basically captures dr thorn Mm-hmm. And that's when Dr. Thorne changes before their eyes. And everybody's like, oh, shit, a manticore. Um, and Nico me- recognizes it from his pseudo D&D, which mm-hmm. I, I know enough about D&D to know that, like, this sounds like D&D, but it's technically nonsense because attack power isn't a thing in D&D. And, but the plus five saving throws, it is a thing. Manticores don't have them. Um, I wrote down D&D stats, though, so we could talk about it for a second. Because um, so... A manticore, there's nothing like too crazy about them in the lore of D&D, but what I thought was interesting was a manticore is the same level as a minotaur, which like Percy has already fought one one on one. It's the same amount of XP. It's the same um, kind of deal, um, at least in terms of you know, like the amount of challenge, Mm -hmm. Um, but manticores can fly. They have those barbs. And um, I don't think that Percy does well with poison. Let's just say he's had too many bad experiences with poison already. So, Mm -hmm. um, and especially more so than in the show, because in the books, there's also the scorpion sting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I just thought it was really funny that like, everything about that whole way it goes down just makes me think of D. &D. the other thing i actually i almost asked my brother but i ran out of time um what i find interesting is that when they refer to the weapons and the shields especially the god forged ones Mm -hmm. they almost refer to the names of them as if it's like a person's name Mm -hmm. instead of saying you know the sword riptide um and I don't, I can't think of any examples of this in mythology myself, which is why I wanted to ask my brother. I'm sure he has one up his sleeve. Um, but I'm thinking of the Master Sword because canonically in Zelda, in um, I believe it's Skyward Sword, your kind of um, companion person is a spirit called Fi. And she ends up becoming part of the Master Sword. Mm-hmm. So theoretically, the Master Sword of Zelda has a spirit within it and like um that spirit can be a voice that speaks to him in fact i believe in like it's either a toked or a boto scene where we see zelda actually speaking to the sword Mm -hmm. so um i think it's boto right i think so before she puts it back in front of the deck yeah Yeah, but i just think it's interesting that rick chose to do that because it's not strictly a greek mythology thing i can't think of an example where a sword kind of has its own spirit like that. I mean, the Aegis is a thing of legend because it's, it's the the Aegis. Um, it has Medusa's head. Zeus and Athena are the only ones who hold it, and his bolts are. But like, there's not really anything like that that's kind of referred to by name. Well, one thing I can say about that is in Magnus Chase, mm-hmm. um, the sword in that series talks yeah and has a whole personality and i don't know if that is from norse norse mythology i think is that nordic norse what are those words mythology like with thor and stuff but that is a whole thing in that series is that the sword has its own personality and talks and stuff and at one point in that series they run into percy enough for the sword to tell him that riptide is a girl (laughs) okay and like considering who riptide like came from and who made it that makes a lot of sense that it would be a girl um but it's just that is something that he puts into his stories 
at one point to where the sword is basically like Riptide is fucking annoyed that you don't call it her because it's a her and he, Percy's just like okay <laughs> yeah. so he might be that might have been like and I that might actually be something in that sort of mythology I don't know if it is or that could be, just be Rick but it could also be part of the mythology that he just added into this part too because why not <laughs> It's fun, yeah. These, yeah. these kids, they can have weapons that have their own spirit and shields. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So, yeah, it's interesting that um, Talia is holding around kind of a replica of Zeus's Aegis. Um, and when you think about it, like what, what came to mind for me with her fighting alongside Annabeth here is Athena literally is the daughter of Zeus holding an Aegis. So it's very double Athena kind of feel yeah. to this situation i felt really weird things about because this whole fighting that was fun was that i guess fun is that percy got to use um his watch his shield that tyson made him and it does like almost break it <laughs> but he does get to use it in a fight and that always makes me happy because i remember that tyson exists and i generally don't because i because dissociation is like crazy i honestly don't remember if he's in this book at all um, yeah. if he talks to tyson in any way like i know he is in other books but i don't remember where like where he shows up so every time he does it'll be a really nice surprise for me again um so that was cool just to see him be able to use it like in in like a battle after getting it because this was only a couple months after that and so this is probably the first time that he's ever had to really use it um, yeah but i had lots of really weird feelings about about um aegis like thalia's shield thing because it is like everybody really likes that and i get why they would like it obviously it's a sword with like medusa's head on it but I was like, I really don't like the idea of Athena being like, here, abusive dad, I made you a sword with a woman a that shield. was, like, yeah, a shield that has a woman that was raped by one, by my sibling and her head is on it and I'm presenting it to you as a prize. Yeah, it's like, icky. And then the idea that uh, Thalia just like has it and is just like using it, I'm like, this makes me so depressed that a like a rape survivor is like stuck just her head is just stuck on a shield and it's not even really her it's like a diluted version of her but the only thing that has survived is just like what Poseidon did to her yeah and that's the only thing that's left and I was just like I'm so depressed <laughs> reading this right now that she, that, that she was like you know taken down to like just that and it, that's 100% because the TV show made Medusa's myth like the better version of it and made her more of a person. And so when I see that, I'm like, oh God, like no rape survivor deserves to be like remembered only for what the person did to you and nothing else. Yeah. Like that really sucks that she's, that that's like her, her shield, but I get it. But now that, that Rick like put much more like emotion behind Medusa, that just feels it just feels so wrong that that Athena did that to her in the first place. And then it just feels so weird that a Zeus kid that doesn't really understand any of this context is just like using it without even understanding what's really what really happened to her. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they'll address that. It's it's kind of just accept like I hate to put it that way, but in mythology, it's kind of just accepted that that's that's how Athena's shield looks. And yeah. um I, I think it probably goes back to misogynistic society and, you know, men being unable to empathize with a woman who has been a victim of something like that. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I can understand, like, theoretically, philosophically, you know, certain people, when they do go through very traumatic things, do turn into a villain sometimes or, or act villainous. Um, I, I don't want to say turn into a villain because like in real life, there's not villains and good guys. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like it, it is a thing that sometimes our trauma leads us to do things that greatly hurt other people. And sometimes that is going to be the only thing we're remembered for. And um, that sucks. I mean, there definitely is a part of me that's like all of the stupid and selfish 
and immature things that I've done in my life haunt me still, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I know they hurt certain people, but, um, I hope that's not the only way I'm remembered. I hope that the, the trauma being projected onto people or, uh, being, you know, like used against them, even when I wasn't realizing I was doing it, doesn't have me as a villain in their head. Yeah. I think about that stuff too. Like, I don't know what people think about me like that. Like, Mm -hmm. I just remember all the people that I knew in my life before the last couple years. I was like, I know that I was like all over the place and I don't even know like what it was like to be around me for most of those years because I don't remember. And also because I was just, there were like too many things that I was trying to deal with in no good ways because there was no good way to deal with all of that stuff. Yeah. And so I think about that too of like, I know that I was dealing with way too many things, like more than a normal person can deal with usually. But at the same time, I know that I was a bad friend to a lot of people. And I like almost like wonder, like, are there people out there who hate me or like think that I'm a horrible person because of how I treated them? And I don't even rem some of the time I don't even remember what I could have done to them. Um, but it's one of those weird things of like, I don't like the idea of people thinking that way about me because I don't want I don't want that to be the only thing and also with me the other thing I think is like I don't want to be like this weird sad story that just like makes people feel sad or like or yeah. makes them feel guilty about whatever like because that also is something that I know happens with people and I don't want that like like the other the other day I did a video on here just talking about how I've been just like frustrated about how I feel like I'm just always limited with like fandom stuff with like who I can talk to because I can't engage in any of the discussions about the villains because it's just too much like there's so much discussion about Luke and I just can't take part in like any of it really because it's too upsetting and it's been like that since I was in fandoms forever like I also <laughs> ignore Draco um yeah. when I was since way back then and and every fandom like that I've always done that but it means that there's a huge part of it that I just can't talk to. And like somebody, like a friend of mine left like a comment on that video being like, basically like, oh, I'm so, it makes me so upset that things are so like hard for you. And I wish that it could be better. And I wish that more, like more programs could like help support you and stuff. And I'm like, I don't want you to feel like pity for me or like, I don't want you to like feel guilty because you have things in your life that I don't. I just want you to listen when I'm talking about this stuff mm -hmm. and but I, I don't like that idea either like and that's m mainly what I didn't like about the whole Medusa thing is this idea that the only thing that has survived about her is what happened to her because she was raped by a god and just the idea that that's the only thing that people know about her I'm like she was an actual person though and had an entire life before this happened to her but this is the only thing that anybody knows about her in like this story anymore and it does like because the tv show did such a good job of mm -hmm. humanizing her and like percy very much like sees her as a as like a person and even though she ends up trying to hurt them he still understands why she's upset and things mm -hmm. like that and so it makes me wonder that when they get to this season like if he'll have a weird reaction to that stuff because because they actually met Medusa and mm -hmm. they went through a whole thing of like humanizing her. But yeah, like I don't I don't want people I don't want people to remember me when I was a huge mess and that's the only thing they know about me. Yeah. But I also don't want them to like remember me as just like somebody whose life is so depressing that it makes them feel guilty about their own life. And I'm like if you're doing that with me, I'd rather you just forget about me completely. <laughs> yeah. Just, bye. <laughs> I'm not going to want that. Porn. Bye. Yeah, like that's like the that's like the worst options out there. Um, all this because she has Medusa on her sword, on her shield. But it's just it's Medusa. It's it's a it's a it's a rape victim. And I'm like, oh god, this is the only one that I know of. At least there there obviously could be more. It's Greek mythology, but she's yeah. the one that I know of at least in this series that is there, and it just feels. It also is kind of like, it almost feels like 
uh, um, like a double shitty thing that that when Thalia is using it, she like she like yells out like for Zeus, and I was like, I'm sorry. Do people say that Thalia is similar to Percy? Percy would like literally jump off of a cliff before he would be like for Poseidon. <laughs> never. Are you kidding me? Like he He's would not never. That cheesy. He would say that and then punch himself in the head. Like he would. He, or Poseidon. <laughs> or he would more likely punch Poseidon or like throw the sword at his head. And I was just like, that is so weird that she's like, for Zeus. And I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> I don't think they're that alike. Um, because she's willing to say that without, like, exploding into dust or something. Yeah, not even <laughs> like, a hint of sarcasm. And I thought it was funny in, a, in, like, a sarcastic almost way in my head that she says that. And because she's, like, a Zeus kid and everyone is, like, deferring to her that Percy is just like, oh yeah, like when she hits him with her stuff, he's probably just gonna die because she's a Zeus kid and she's obviously the most powerful one because all of my friends now are obsessed with her and they ignore me. And then she hits like the monster with it and nothing happens. <laughs> and, like the monster's fine. <laughs> and he keeps attacking them and it's like, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so all three of them appeared to be screwed. Bianca and Nico still don't even know that they're demigods. And then a chopper comes around. And this is also another, like, raising the stakes because it's very clear that the chopper is being flown by, like, just literal mortals. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it's it starts... I mean, we've seen a little bit of the mortals being controlled on the cruise ship because Luke had mortals there. They seem to be in a sort of trance state. And your and I's idea, at least, is they're probably monster food. Mm -hmm. um, but these ones being literally controlled to do, like, to operate heavy machinery, it definitely raises the stakes more than these mindless zombies on a cru cruise ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it has to do with who the general, the general. Yeah. is and and all that but it is like like I, like I said before like the things that they're going up against are so much bigger mm -hmm. than anything that they've ever really gone after before like before it was just Luke and now there is a freaking like commando helicopter that would be used in like at that at the time the books were coming out was when the Afghanistan war was still happening mm -hmm. and so it's something that would be used like over there and they're shooting at a bunch of Teenagers. middle schoolers <laughs> and trying to kill them and trapping them on this cliff where there's like nowhere for them to go mm -hmm. and nothing for them to do and it's i think it's like the way that i imagine that scene like i just imagine what it would look like at, on the show at this point is like how to picture these scenes mm -hmm. is like that scene is really interesting to me because it's a whole thing of percy is protecting like bianca and nico because he thinks that that's who the helicopter is going after but they're actually trying to go after him the entire time mm -hmm. and like they he knows that but I, I don't think it's really like clicked in his head yet that that's really what they're trying to do that yeah. everyone else is basically just like annoying them they just want him and because he's hiding with these kids they can't just like pick him up and take him and so he's trying to protect the kids while everyone else is trying to take him <laughs> and like and everyone else there like you know, Annabeth and Grover and Thalia and stuff, they didn't have time to talk to him. They didn't hear the villain monologue. And so they're all assuming that they're trying to take the kids with a helicopter too, but they're actually just trying to take him the entire time. And they don't realize it. And so like their plan doesn't really work right because they don't, because they're just like assuming that, that, oh, they're just here for Nico and Bianca. And it's like, no, Nico and Bianca were literally just like a spider in a trap they're they're here just for percy um mm -hmm. they don't actually care about these kids they just are using them to get what they want and that just makes it all more complicated <laughs> yeah yeah so the kids get rescued then by wispy silvery arrows which um i mean we have been waiting for the huntresses a little bit because i know we both said we would be them um if if we had a choice when we were younger but um yeah so i love that rick kind of colors the arrow silver there's kind of a silver aura around the girls and it very much gives moonlight vibes um mm -hmm. especially when you contrast that to apollo would probably be the warm goldens yep 
Yeah, yeah. And we get that Thalia doesn't like them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I know why she doesn't like them. There's a very clear antagonistic thing happening between her and Zoe. Um, mm-hmm. And let's see, what else did I catch on to? I think this is interesting, um, just from the duality of Artemis and Apollo. He remarks that these girls shoot better than the Apollo kids. And so um, <laughs> that sticks out to me, especially when you think Artemis is the goddess of the hunt, but specifically small animals. Mm-hmm. What's harder to shoot than a small animal? You know, like mm-hmm. if you're going for a deer versus a rabbit, um, you know, like one's a much bigger target. So um, that stuck out to me as a little detail. And um, so, yeah, we have this group of girls come in and Percy notices, he says he would estimate that the youngest one is about 10 years old and the oldest one is about 14. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the one oldest... that seems to be in charge is not is not the 14 year old. <laughs> yeah, it's Zoe. I think Zoe is the one that's 14 mm-hmm. and she is kind of like the second in command to like Artemis. Um, but (laughs) I don't know how to put this besides to be like really blunt, but when I was reading this, like, I know why, like, I know that Annabeth is like thinking about joining the hunters and I know that Thalia eventually does. And I know that she doesn't like the hunters or an Artemis and, and specifically Zoe. Mm -hmm. She doesn't like Zoe because when they were on the run before they got to camp, before she died, Zoe was like, you need to leave Luke behind yeah, and join us instead. And she was like, you know, fuck you. Um, it was actually a good, like, it would have been a better choice for her overall, obviously, if she had done that. And like, yeah. there was a part of her that knew that Luke was the problem. But it's also like, he's the only person that she had at that point. Um, <laughs> but I just have to say it and be done with it. Artemis is grooming these people. <laughs> like, this is... <laughs> this is grooming like because when you look at the people that join the hunters um like thalia was 12 years old she was homeless she Mm -hmm. was on for like at least a year or something i think by that point she was by herself on the run being attacked by monsters they had just stopped at luke's mom's house where he saw him scream at at hermes and say how much he hated him and so and like that whole upsetting situation that happened so they don't have anywhere to go they've been on the run for a while luke is the only one that she has but he's fighting everything and causing all of these problems and that is the moment like when you decide you should give up your entire mortality at the age of 12 and join me instead and it's Mm -hmm. like that is such a vulnerable position for her to be in annabeth is 14 and she is desperate because she doesn't want to move across the country with her dad far away from everyone else that she knows and that's what makes her consider joining the hunters and bianca hasn't done it yet that's like the next chapter but bianca joins the hunters she's 12. she is 12. she doesn't have any family left and within one chapter she abandons her little brother for the rest of his life Mm -hmm. to join the hunters and leaves him alone yeah and i'm like this is grooming you are grooming little girls to join your little merry band of hunters what the fuck (laughs) like what is going on like this is literal grooming the oldest hunter is 14. like you are not old enough to decide whether you should give up the entirety of your mortal life for like this god that is like telling you yeah, join my fun, like, merry band of hunters. There's no men, and, like, you can't have anything to do with men. But other than that, you can basically just live forever and do whatever you want. But it's, like, these kids are all in, like, really vulnerable situations. And somebody just pops up and is, like, I can solve all of your problems overnight by running away from all of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm, like, I don't think that Bianca would have abandoned Nico for the rest of his fucking life when he was a 10 year old child and literally had nobody. She's his only family that is alive. Like that's it is Bianca. (laughs) And like, if, if there wasn't somebody like basically grooming her and I was just like, this is so fucking weird because I like 
Artemis more than the other gods, but I'm also like, this is so obvious. And I don't know what to do with this information anymore. Yeah, I don't know. I've always had such a favorable view of Artemis, so it's really hard for me because what I see with Artemis is I see trying to hang on to a concept or a um, kind of a vibe of girlhood, you know? And you and I are a little bit jaded like this because neither of us have ever had a girl group. You know, we've never had a group of girlfriends where we're like yeah this is these are our ladies um mm -hmm. but i i do somewhat think that like that is more of the motive um because artemis chose to stay a maiden she chose to never get married she chose to never have children and i do think yes she is roping girls in before they realize what that choice means if they take it on themselves mm -hmm. but at the same time i do i do recognize that there is the need to protect girlhood you know with baked within artemis so yeah she, she probably shouldn't be interacting with the people who she does but yeah, i um, guess i guess the thing i i like wonder is like are you protecting girlhood doing that that's not really to me that doesn't make sense because you're like forcing them to fit the mold of what you think a girl is yeah like you as artemis thinks that being this like version of femininity that you like means that you don't have anything to do with men and mm. don't have any like access or anything like that to men and mm -hmm. so that's like your version of girlhood but you're like forcing all these other young girls to be like you before they're really old enough to really understand who they yeah. actually are and who they would actually want to be like annabeth doesn't know like who she is when it comes to any of that stuff she's only like newly for i think she's four yeah she's 14 and so like she's very young like who you are when you're in eighth grade is in no way who you're going to be for your entire life and so i'm like i'm not even sure that you're protecting girlhood i feel like she thinks that she is but it's more like she's like making girls be who she thinks girls should be and it, that's not the right way either and like that stuff always bothers me because um because most people don't think that like with me i don't fit like any mold whatsoever <laughs> when it comes to like femininity stuff or like gender stuff ever like my dad treated my dad was so confusing but he in general but he would want me to be more like like a guy like he obviously wanted like a boy as a daughter because he tried to have us do like every sport imaginable and do like more stereotypical like masculine sort of things he he tried to get my sister to join sports and stuff too um but i definitely joined more being like the older one but then at the same time he would do his other stuff with me where he very much like wanted to take advantage of the fact that i was a girl and yeah. it, so it, it like was very confusing which is why i think i'm gender fluid because i don't understand what either of those things necessarily mean but it's just that whole idea of like i like i say that i could join artemis because i don't want to have sex and so it would be the easiest thing in the world for me to join this group and not have sex like that that would not be like a barrier for me to join that would be fine and but at the same time i'm like i'm not sure that i would actually like this though because I like, I usually get along with guys. Like, like growing up, I had a lot of friends that were guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mo a lot of the time. And because I think I, that's just, that side of me comes out more, like the more like soft, like feminine side just like doesn't as much. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, I'm not even sure that I would fit in with this group, which seems like it would be a place for me to fit in. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's like the general feeling of like, like, I know she's doing what she thinks is right. Obviously, all of the gods are. They're not doing this stuff just to be, like, vindictive, except Zeus, probably, yeah. most of the time. But it's also a thing of, like, you're, like, forcing young girls to act how you think they should. Especially because the stories about her is that if you're, like, caught with, like, a guy, she just immediately kicks you out. Mm -hmm. And there's, like, no time. There's no, like talking about anything it's just like you're immediately just gone mm -hmm. and so the idea that like if you're evolving yourself with men that that makes you less than 
I don't like that idea either. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just, I don't know how to feel about any of that stuff, but I think they're obviously a huge storyline in this book is Artemis and the Hunters and all that. So I'm like kind of curious to see how I feel about all of them by the time we get to the end, because it does, I don't know, it's just a confusing like gender sort of thing to like think about how aggressive she is about how she thinks these young girls should act. Yeah, like I mean, the Greek gods aren't exactly great at balance. <laughs> that's what we've noticed. Like, I do think that's what I'm trying to convey, I think, is that I feel like it comes from partially a good place. And it's one of those things where it's like impact versus intent. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure she, I'm sur sure that 12 year old, 13 year old Artemis was like, why is my dad going around with all these different women? I don't like that. Ew. Mm -hmm. And it was like, let me protect these women. Um, but I, I don't know, you know, um, there, so it's, it's hard for me to call it all bad. Um, I don't know. I think I just like Artemis though. <laughs> well, that, well, and like, that's the thing is like, like you can, I know I said this in like our grooming <laughs> episode, but you can, groom people thinking that you're doing like a good thing even if you're not yeah. even if you think you think that you're helping them or being nice to them like people sometimes do those things without no realizing that they're doing something that could be harmful and so that is true about her is that i don't think that she's being malicious or anything like that but it just like is still like a true fact like she's trying to convince annabeth to give up her entire life when she's 14 years old and we know all the great stuff she does in the future and so it's like wild to think what would have happened like i generally don't think that percy would have survived that mm -hmm. like losing annabeth as a friend at this point in his life like i think he like uh he would he would be like physically okay but a part of him would i think he wouldn't ever trust anybody mm -hmm. besides grover ever again he already has a hard time trusting people but it's just the idea that this god thinks that she's helping young girls find like a place in the world but that would have been like devastating he yeah. i'm not sure that he would have survived like the like through like the big last battle if annabeth wasn't there not only because he wouldn't have trusted anybody and she helps him with that but also just because you know of the things that happen in in the next coming books like it's just wild to think that that's that was like something that artemis wanted to happen um mm -hmm. and it like luckily it doesn't happen but it's still like the fact that it was even like an option yeah is just like whoa <laughs> but it is true that like it's not like she's trying to do anything bad but still she's it's the whole thing with like the gods in these books is that they see like kind of the way that they live their life as like above above like the human experience and like above demigods and things like that and so they, they she doesn't consider the fact that these kids like have entire lives and that those lives are worth like wanting to work out and instead of just giving all of those up to join her instead yeah um yeah because i mean some adult experiences are really you know worth growing up for i guess um mm -hmm. you know i could say that as a person with a very traumatized childhood and family situation, growing my own family has been a very healing experience. And I wouldn't have had that had I sworn off men. So, yeah, I would never, oh my God, I would never want to be stuck mm -hmm. um, in the version of me when I was like 14, 13, 11, 12 years old for permanently for the rest of my life. Like, that would be like literally hell on earth for me to be mm -hmm. stuck in that place like i love that version of me now but um no <laughs> like yeah. she also would not want that that version of all of that stuff because she wanted to believe that one day things would get better yeah. um and that was the whole reason why she kept trying even though everything was as bad as it possibly humanly could be and mm -hmm. so the idea that i would be stuck in that at that age and in that place forever that would be horrible yeah. oh my god so yeah like you don't know how much better things can get when you're older and it, it's like weird to like just picture that of like giving up everything when you're 
so young and just like stay in that way forever Mm -hmm. um like obviously when stuff happens with thalia later on that's like a whole theme of thinking about that like thalia will never age percy and annabeth are probably going to get married one day and have kids and and she's just going to be 16 forever yeah and that's just like such a a, like a difficult thing to like think about that she's going to live through all of her friends dying yeah it's just odd yeah it's the one part of like i think i think i've heard some of the twilight people say this because i have a few that i follow but like bella obviously when she turns she's already saying i'm never gonna see my dad again i'm never gonna see my mom again characters that we've been introduced to you know in the series we knew that she literally took care of her mom her whole childhood and that we never hear about her again once she becomes a vampire um like luckily charlie is somehow allowed to still see her that doesn't even make sense in universe but still (laughs) you know like that's one thing that like i don't know that i could honestly do that the fantasy of wanting to be immortal or wanting to be a vampire or you know a huntress if we're going strictly greek mythology it would be a harsh reality yeah i don't i don't i wouldn't be able to do that i would like drive myself insane if i was just severely mentally ill for all the time like Mm -hmm. i don't want that like the whole point of life is that it one day you know ends and that's yeah. what makes it what it is like and it's just weird like i feel like we can say at least speak on this since we both have gone no contact with people in our family mm-hmm. that i feel like it's easier for people to imagine never speaking to somebody again than it actually is when you actually do it yeah and it, it's so hard it it's really really hard to know that somebody is like out there alive and you don't talk to them and other people you do talk to do see them but you don't Mm -hmm. and you just like cry for seven thousand years all the time and it it's just that's hard enough alone when it's not like there's like something that's changed about me where like if i did see that person would be afraid of me now which i think is part of the whole thing when you're immortal because of something happening to you that is a big part of it is like kind of what I was trying to say about Thalia is that the friends that she has knows her how she is now but like at some point like they will change and she will not Mm -hmm. like everyone that she meets when it comes to demigods they will all like progress and change and grow and like mature and become different people as more time goes on and she will stay like this static form of her 15 year old self forever and it's just like at some point it's like how do you talk to those people how do you stay having relationships with those people when you never when you are stuck never changing and they're always constantly changing and growing and Mm -hmm. doing things that you can't do and so it's just that's that's so hard and like thalia has people that she and like obviously what i was saying about bianca like you just abandon you're gonna abandon your little brother who has and nobody else he has nobody else and like granted things happen with bianca in this book but like if she you know if that doesn't happen to her like what happens to her in this book she still would have like still abandoned nico when he's he's 10 and like that's horrible to think of him like he has such a hard time dealing with that for the rest of this book series already because she abandoned him before what happens to her happens and so it's like a double like whammy because she left him before before she actually left and so it's like she made sure to tell him that she doesn't that she would just leave him before what happens to her does and so it just makes it all so much harder for him and it didn't need to be like that i guess it's just a weird feeling like i don't know i just think that people like when i whenever i read things with like um immortal beings or whatever i think that's why i like enjoy twilight for the crazy mormon vampireness that it is but i never got i didn't get as into it as other people and i don't like i liked buffy but i liked everything about buffy except for like the vampires really the one vampire mm-hmm. in the show that i liked a lot was spike because he was so different 
than multifaceted yeah yeah mo than most of the other characters but that's why i don't really i never was into like interview with the vampire that much like i don't want to watch the new show that came out or anything like that i was i wasn't into the old version so um, a bunch of my friends were and so i watched the old movie with like tom cruise and brad pitt and stuff a lot when i was growing when i was in like high school but i just could never connect to it as much because of that whole thing of like imagining actually staying the same forever and having to leave everyone you love behind like that just sounds so horrible like i i wonder about friends that i haven't spoken to in like a year and like what they're doing <laughs> much less everyone that i've ever met for the rest of eternity and knowing that i can never talk to them that would be that would be so hard it would be yeah i mean one of my first TikToks to ever blow up and this was before my account actually blew up blew up mm -hmm. um I posted about how the ex that um, I read Percy Jackson with actually mm -hmm. completely fell off this, the face of the earth after we broke up. Like nobody has heard from him. Nobody knows what he's up to now. Like mm -hmm. just if I Google him, nothing comes up. I know his dad has a few patents. His mom is, is involved with the library system around here, but like <laughs> nothing. And so I made these TikToks like this person just like vanished off the face of the earth and everyone's like you still have a card for them don't you it's like no i i was very emotionally invested in this person for a while and yeah i am just curious how they're doing <laughs> mm -hmm. it is like there's people like that in my life too like i get can my memory is so weird that i don't even know what i'm doing a lot of the time because i'm like i don't know if this person if like something happened with this person that i can't even remember anymore um and they would be like talking about stuff and i'd be like what because that happens in so many conversations like even like you know the blake lively stuff that happened this week i was talking about what i remembered from following gossip girl stuff and one of my friends from back then was like oh don't you remember this 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 and this and i was like no absolutely not i don't remember anything <laughs> i don't remember that's, that's how my or anything but i there are people like that that I used to be friends with just even online people that just like, you know, they, they like stop talking. We like stopped talking a couple years ago and I've tried to like find out their name or like look them up and I can't find anything about them. And I'm just like, it's not because I like have some weird thing going on with them. I'm just like, I hope they're okay. Yeah. And I just like wonder how they're doing, but there's like no way of really finding out how they are. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, so moving on with the book anyway, because we, we were on the hunters for a while. Um, <laughs> one thing that, again, with Percy Jackson noticing things but not saying things, mm -hmm. I do think he notices that Artemis is Artemis before he does. And the hint mm -hmm. is that, um, let's see, his description was, her face was so beautiful, it made me catch my breath, but her expression was stern and dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, that's That's definitely, like gods and goddesses are gonna look like the most beautiful humans you've ever seen um that's kind of how it goes when they appear to you or the mm -hmm. most interesting you know like intriguing the kind of person that catches your eye mm -hmm. um so i just do want to note that percy noticed there was something different about this girl yeah one, um, one of the things about percy that i always like is the like traumatizedness that he does where he it, mm -hmm. from the first book on he's always like watching people's behavior and like the way that they talk the way that they stand and things like that and that's where a lot of the ways that he figures things out come from and i'm like yeah that's <laughs> that's what we do <laughs> when you're yeah. around somebody who's dangerous that's just what you do to survive so i kind of love that in this world he notices things like that and puts things together where he's like i don't know who this girl is necessarily but I know that she's somebody really powerful, so she's probably mm -hmm. a god or something like that, but I don't know who she is. And like with the principal, it's like, there's something off about you. You're like some sort of a monster, but I don't know which one. It just reminds me of like me when I'm like scrolling on TikTok and I'm like, you're weird. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I don't know why something just makes me feel uncomfortable about you. And then like seven months later, I see a video of somebody being like, this person sexually abused somebody. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, that's, yeah. that's, that's where that I came from. Out. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Um, so 
the hunters come in, they start firing away, and then Annabeth jumps on top of a manticore at one point and is attacking it. Um, and, you know, Percy's freaking out because they're they're shooting at the manticore with their bows and arrows. Han Annabeth is on top of it. And then yeah. at some point, the manticore leaps away with Annabeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I like I just always picture I always picture the actors anyway and that scene I can like picture how that would go and it's just horrible to imagine like like I that's what I kind of mean about this scene it's just like it's like pure chaos mm -hmm. like the manticore is there there's a helicopter shooting at them then suddenly Artemis and her hunters are there and they're shooting at the manticore but Percy is like stop shooting at it you're gonna kill my best friend and then she's just gone mm -hmm. and especially I always liked um because it's just Percy how he is, that they literally have to hold him down. Yeah. That like multiple hunters have to hold him down to stop him from getting up and just like jumping off of the cliff to go after her. Yeah. And and I always liked how um he's just screaming at like yelling at them, screaming at them, like, no, like what are you doing? I have to go, I have to go after her. I have to go after Annabeth. I'm not just gonna sit here and like and how like zoe gets mad at him at first and artemis is like no he's he's not being disrespectful he's just distraught and yeah. it's like yeah he's just like i can't lose my best friend <laughs> like yeah. wh what are you doing get off of me i need to go save my best friend and it's not until like a literal god is like i am a god and you would not survive if you jumped off of this cliff that he finally like stops trying to get away but i'm like yeah that's that's the reaction you should have when your best friend is like suddenly taken from you. Yeah. Um, yeah. The reason the disrespect gets called out was because he's like, who even are you? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, and, why and, have you done this to me and my best yeah. friend? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, we know he's recognized that this is someone important, someone special, and he knows well enough to know you don't disrespect the gods, but he's just, and I do love that Artemis defends him in that moment. It's like, yeah, he didn't, he didn't mean it like, you know, anything yeah. bad. So just let him go. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, Isa says Zoe is going to slap him. Lord, that is not the thing that he needed in that moment of his life. Um, but yeah, I'm really glad that she didn't do that. <laughs> um, but yeah. I, I really like that that whole thing is really hard um, and it's very chaotic and everything, but it's also just a thing of this book that this series in general that like things change so quickly yeah. that like five minutes before this, they were just like in this school talking at a dance and now she's gone kidnapped because she was trying to protect Bianca and Percy and Nico from this bad monster and now she's been taken when they were supposed to take him and so it's this horrible thing that they came here to take him but they took his best friend instead yeah um, that's like a literal hell on earth for for anybody but especially for him it's like all of this is his like he's gonna think about it as like this stuff is my fault like all of this happened because they were going after me and my best friend was taken because she was trying to protect me. Mm -hmm. Like, that's absolutely horrible. <laughs> Which is yeah. why a lot of the stuff that happens in this book happens the way that he does. Like, the joke about that people make about Percy and Titan's Curse is that he is just, like, a rage being the entire book. He's so angry at everyone and everything. And I'm like, he should be. Like, yeah. that's, that's the point of this book. He should be. And that's why I love this book series in general, but I love it especially compared to, like, Harry Potter because, like, Harry has moments where he's mad about stuff in Prisoner of Azkaban, but he never really gets to ever be just justifiably pissed the way yeah. that he should be. Like, everyone, all these adults in that book are trying to keep it a secret from him that this guy supposedly killed his parents and was his dad's best friend. Mm -hmm. He has a right to know that about his life. And this whole book, they're, like, trying to keep it a secret from him that because they're afraid that he's going to, like, get mad enough to go after him. And, and like, in this doing book... And so, create the situation that they were scared of the entire yeah, time. And there is, like, something, like, similar enough to that in this book in the way that, you know, in the, in the next coming chapters that we read, like, they don't want 
they don't want Percy to go on the quest because they because they're like you're just gonna go to to go after Annabeth and it's like well no fucking shit but also like he's she's his best friend did you really think that his best friend would get kidnapped when they're trying to kidnap him and he would just sit at camp and just sit on his hands and be like fine with like would you be fine with that yeah no you would not be fine with that so shut the fuck up about how you're talking to him like this that it, this entire book he's completely validated for being so angry at everyone because they're all treating him like shit <laughs> that's literally this book is they they all treat him like garbage most of the time and he's just trying to put up with it so that he can save his best friend's life and yeah. it's like none of this should actually be this difficult and it's it's like a, a breath of fresh air honestly to see like especially a younger like main character that is allowed to be angry mm -hmm. um because a lot of people what see like inherently a bad thing like that it's that if you're angry it means that you're like dangerous or scary or you're in the wrong or whatever that's just how people tend to see anger and and that it, there's a whole like discussion i could have about percy being angry in general that like people kind of talk about him as if the moments that he's angry is moments when he's being dangerous or he could like turn to like a bad side or be like Luke or something that if he's angry at people, it means that he's, um, you know, being like Luke or something like that. And it's like, that's not how any of this stuff, that's not how anger works. Like he's not being a dangerous, scary person because he's mad. He should be mad. There would be something wrong with him if he wasn't mad. And so I like reading this sort of series where Rick lets his main character just be really fucking angry about everything as he should be like my best friend was just kidnapped by somebody who was trying to kidnap me yeah and i and now i have to deal with that that she was taken because of because they were going after me instead obviously he and especially on top of all the stuff that's going on with salia and how nobody like respects him anymore purely because she's there it's like yeah he should be angry at all of you and you should like be begging him for your forgiveness <laughs> by the way yeah. after that all of this stuff is over yeah literally the only one that was staying on task um yeah so um we leave off the chapter with artemis you know and answering i'm i'm the goddess of the hunt um you know like you're just gonna have to trust me and percy still kind of being held back um yeah good luck with getting percy to trust a god who hasn't <laughs> proven it yet <laughs> exactly um <laughs> So that covers what we read up until today, because we we only read the first two chapters together. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of show news. We didn't talk about Tantalus yet. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. cast Tantalus with the perfect actor. <laughs> oh my god, um, he's he was in Veep. I'm gonna like put you know a scene here when I put it up on YouTube and on TikTok and stuff because it is. I found a clip that the one that you sent me where he's like doing a whole speech about food where he's like, when I was growing up, I didn't have to eat green beans and I got this, he's like six, five. So he's like, and I got this tall without any like healthy food. If I get elected, I'm going to take away all the healthy food. Damn you guys for trying to teach kids to eat healthy and stuff. And I was like, this basically is tantalus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just in the show veep and like that one clip of him saying that math was invented by the chinese to make americans feel stupid just made him laugh. yeah <laughs> that's how i feel about math too so it made me laugh so hard and i'm like why is math so hard but it was just those two clips alone i was like can they do like a five minute like mini episode where they just put a camera in the same room as him and jason matsukas who plays um, Dionysus and just let them ad lib like don't even give them lies <laughs> just just like let them stay in a room together and talk because that would be the funniest thing that anyone has ever seen it's gonna be so funny to watch them play uh, off of each other oh my god <laughs> it's gonna be great and I like we pointed this out when we read <laughs> you monsters, but Tantalus is there for the physical comedy of food being chased away. And we also saw 
Becky on the Myth of Magic Twitter saying we're going to make sure that there's the physical comedy aspect. So um, I'm really excited for that because it made me laugh. It yeah. made me laugh too that Becky has seriously put a lot of thought into if they're going to tell everyone that he got his his thing from the gods because he made the gods eat his own children. I'm really glad that Becky is also thinking about like, are you going to tell them that? Yeah. <laughs> like I, I kind of hope they, they they do somehow just because it's so horrible yeah. that he does that. It's <laughs> but like, I it's... oh, I tried to feed my son to Zeus. That's why I'm here. But I just imagine like Becky sitting there with Rick when they're, they're eating dinner and being like, "Are they? Are we going to tell that on our children's show?" <laughs> we'll find um, a way to slip it in. I'm sure. Yeah. And like I've already seen many videos from Harry Harry from Percy Jackson fans, you know the the slang term like he ate mm -hmm. them saying that for Tantalus. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so that's gonna be a joke, I'm very sure. Um, the other stuff with like the show that I've seen is just like little interview clips with Walker and Arian and Leah. Them mm -hmm. like the like Leah said like um, basically about the beginning of season two. She's like. Um, Annabeth went to Disneyland. Percy told her like some movies to watch before she went, so she could act like a more like normal kid, like she knew what the fuck Disney Disneyland was. And the way she put it was, she comes back, and um, Percy is with somebody that she does not like. <laughs> yeah. And they were like just talking about that of the whole Tyson Annabeth stuff that Annabeth has a problem with Tyson, and that it's interest they're talking about how interesting it has been already so far to like film those scenes and um just talking about how they like really like working with daniel so far that he's filming all the scenes with them like arian did in season one um so it's a definite change for all three of them that he's not there as much um mm -hmm. so far but it is part of what this show is like which is why I hope they make up scenes for Aryan and have him have more scenes with other people so that he can be more included. Oh, the thing that I thought was really funny <laughs> was um, in one of in one of these interview clips, Walker says something about they're talking about like, oh, what do the fans like ask you? And they all were basically saying that they'll they'll try to ask us like who get who has gotten like cast in like one of the roles or something like that. And they obviously don't tell them anything, but that's like the kind of stuff that they'll ask them. And Walker said something about like, oh, those those like parts won't be like on set or anything like that for a couple months, like anyway. And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, that's kind of what I assumed. But yeah, then, <laughs> oh my God. I just remembered like the, all the clips they've ever done of like, who gives away all the spoilers? And they're yes. like, oh, definitely Dior. And then I see, like, I saw this clip and I went to go, like, look it up to make sure it was real. And I was like, oh, this is really real. <laughs> that, like, on her Instagram, she posted a bunch of photos of all of them from D23. And Danielle, I forget, Jalade, Jil who is the person that people speculated as um, oh, yeah. Thalia for a while. But she, like, said somewhere at some point that, no, she didn't get the part for Thalia. Um, so I was like, okay, is, she's not going to be her, but that doesn't mean she's not going to be anybody. She just like comments on this post and is like, oh, like on a picture of Leah and Dior, like, oh my girls, and Dior replies and is like, I wish that it would just be October so you could be up here with us. And I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> I just like couldn't stop laughing seeing that. Yeah. And I was like, okay, so she's someone. <laughs> She's, she's somewhere in there. She's at least maybe on camp, maybe on one of the ships. Who knows? <laughs> she could be um, Allison. She could be she could be Selena, really, too. Um, that's somebody that would be in the season and would be an important person moving forward. They could she could be she could be somebody else. But those are like the main cast that we know of. And it was just beyond funny to see her be like, oh, I wish you would just be up here in, in October like you're going to be. And I was just like child <laughs> like, yeah like you're they're not kidding that you give everything away <laughs> the, the like main trio like in the interviews there's this like cute part where they're asking leah about like what her character is like in season two 
and she looks over at Rick and she's like, am I allowed to answer? Am I allowed to like answer the question? And her eyes like are all big and stuff. And he's like, yeah, it's fine. Like, go, go, go ahead. But she like, they, every time they ask them something where they have, where they could like give something away, they would look over at him to make sure that it was okay for them to say that. And yeah. so like, they're being so careful. And then she's on Instagram being like, see you in October. <laughs> So she's probably going to be somebody. <laughs> yeah. So that's one, that's one actress. Like, I don't know why, I'll, like, as, obviously I was like, well, maybe she got a part in something else or maybe, and cause I was like, there's no other reason why she would suddenly be in Vancouver, Canada in October, um, without it being like something filming wise. But I'm like, that would be really weird though if she was going up there to film something else because they still would never see her if she was filming something else because they would be on different sets like every day for like 10 hours a day. And so I was yeah. like, pretty much the only option we have is that she was cast as something and Dior basically gave it all away in her fucking Instagram section, like comments. <laughs> so that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but um, we haven't gotten any other hint of any of the kid casting yet. I know there's so many that we're waiting for besides Talia and Allison. I know people have mentioned Charles Beckendorf a little bit here and there. Yeah. Too. Um, so that'll be interesting. Um, let's see what else. For next week, we're reading chapters three and four of Titan's Curse, which starts off with Bianca making a choice so we'll just in order to not spoil it anymore even though we kind of already did whatever